All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I uh, work in the uh, Seagate in the software side of things. And today I'm going to talk about what Seagate has been doing to um, contribute back to the community in the open source world. And uh, one of the projects that I've been working on for a long time, and we open sourced it back in November of uh, 2017. So it's been a little while. And one of the things I just want to mention, be very clear about, is that anything that I present today, it will work on any drive that you have out there. It doesn't matter if it's a SAS, SATA, or NVMe, and it doesn't need to be a Seagate drive. So just keep that in mind while I talk through it. If your train of thought is thinking that, oh, this is going to only happen in Seagate, that's, that's not true. It, it will work with anything. So with that in mind, let me talk about why, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here. There was a, you know, back in the day, the life was simpler. We have our drives in laptops, desktops, maybe in the enterprise storage devices. But now, uh, customer is getting diverse, and our customers are integrating our storage devices in multiple ecosystems, software ecosystems. So we're trying to be in um, you know, set-top boxes, game consoles, robots even. So as the ecosystem of the device in where the, it's been integrated changes, so it does have to be the support tools, softwares, and libraries. They have to keep up with that change in technology, right? So if you have an ARM processor, which is running on a set-top box trying to talk to a NAS you know, like system or, or a surveillance device, uh, you need to be able to run tools and softwares within that ecosystem rather than to come out of that. You don't have to ask the customer to take it out. So the problem statement is that all of our software needs to run on platform independent you know, fashion, which means that it should work on um, ARM, MIPS, x86, all these others. And at the same time, the diverse um, operating systems that our customers are running in. So that includes FreeBSD. That includes you know, uh, Solaris, Windows, Linux being one of the main ones, right? So you have to be, in that regard, pretty agnostic to it. But then uh, most of our customers are not just taking one type of device. So they're taking SATA devices, SAS devices, NVMe devices. And most of the time, the things that you're doing to those devices is the same. It's not any different. So I'll give you an example. Everybody loves to do sanitize or erase a device. Sanitize is supported in SATA. It's supported in SAS. It's also supported as a crypto erase in NVMe spec. When you're trying to do, you, you don't want the user to have to worry about which device you're actually trying to talk to. And these are all industry standards, right? And then you will give the user a ability to not have to worry about which OS he's running in. So that gives them another. So if you're writing applications, which have to be OS agnostic, and you're trying to be device agnostic as well, you're only worried about your use case and not anything else. So what we came up with is an open source tool that not only has uh, utilities, which are command line tools, but also libraries that are built on top of it. So if you don't like the way we have implemented the command line tool, you can actually take those same libraries and build your own tool in, on top of it. And we do that in Seagate as well. We have you know, GUI tools which are built on top of the same library infrastructure that I'm going to describe today. So our tool actually is, as I, like I mentioned, use case space. So you, if you're trying to change power to a device, it doesn't matter if it's a SATA or a SAS, you can still change power to it. If you're trying to configure a drive, which is 512 in logical blocks to a 4K, you don't really know, want to know, like, is it SATA or SAS? You can still be able to do that, right? If you're trying to do a firmware download, it doesn't need to be very specific. You have a specific microcode that you need to download to a device. The rest of the things shouldn't you know, make a difference. So that's use case space. And we support the T10, T13, and NVMe specifications. We are FreeBSD, Solaris, as well as Windows and Linux supported. Uh, we have different architectures. And as the, the main thing I want to take away from this slide is that it's really portable. What does it mean by portable? For those of you who are in the Linux world, if you do an LDD on a device, it gives you a big, long list of tree of all the different libraries you are supported on, right? I, if you take one of our tools and do an LDD on it, there are only three things it actually, is actually you know, um, depends on. How is that different? It's different because if you take that tool and try to compile it with your own tool chain, you wouldn't get into a lot of dependency issues, which if you're a software engineer, you will always want to try to avoid. So our dependency tree is very small, and that's how we're able to integrate into set-top boxes and robots, as well as big enterprise systems at the same time. And like I said, it's built on customizable um, you know, libraries, so you can actually take that library and create your own solution for it. 
There are different use cases that we go for. So there's a utility and libraries which are just dealing with configure. So configure includes, you know, you're want, trying to change the file speed or you're trying to provision the drive into, you know, setting the max LVA one way or the other. Erase, um, I really want to highlight the quickest erase. So a lot of times our uh, folks are trying to actually, trying to figure out like I, I have a device that can do crypto but on the same server, I have devices that only can do block arrays, which takes a little bit longer, right? And it depends on how you're, you're dealing with it. But then there will be other legacy devices on that same system which are doing, you know, old style secure arrays of, you know, or um, security arrays of ATA. So what, we have an API called Quickest Array. So if you call that API, we under the, the hood do all of the work for you and figure out what is the quickest way to erase this device. But if you want to go really deep down and say, I want to crypto erase, sanitize that device, you can actually use that as well. You can format the device, like I mentioned, 12K to 4, you know, 4K. Generic tests include some of the hard drive specific tests. Like if you're trying to figure out if the drive is functioning correctly, you can do a butterfly test, an ODID, which is the inner diameter, outer diameter test. And these are all open source and freely available. In the power, you can do EPC. So EPC is also one of those standards which is not specific to one you know, um, command set. So EPC is also supported in SAS as well as in SATA. So if you want to change your power settings on either of the two interfaces, you can do that. Smart, we don't want to compete with Smart One tools, but at the same time, we want to provide uh, you know, a use case for, for that particular system. So we have some of the derived self-test, you know, repair um, uh, you know, logic in, in our utilities as well as in our libraries as well. So logs are all of the you know, mode pages and log pages in the SAS world, the logs that are available in the NVMe spec, as well as the GPL logs that are available in the SATA interface. So let's go a little bit more on the architectural design of how it's been implemented. So at the end of the day, we have one device, right? It doesn't matter where that device is. It's integrated into a, um, you know, a, any of the embedded systems and, and running Linux on it, or it could be a Azure system with you know, Windows running on top of it. You need a transport layer to actually talk to it. So uh, we have a library called OpenC Transport that you can go to GitHub and download. And that will encapsulate, if you have a single command and you wanna actually download, I mean, take that command to a drive, that OpenC Transport library will take the nuances of all the different operating system structures out for you. So you issue that command and we figured it out, oh, you're running Linux, so I need to do SGIO IOCTO. Oh, you're running Windows, so I need to do a dev IO control on this. You're running FreeBSD, so I need to go through the CAM control system. So the same works for all the different OSs that we're trying to support, right? So that's, that's the layer which abstracts the OS out of things for you. And then once you go one layer above, we have operations. Operations is all those libraries which are OS agnostic. So an operation example would be that you're trying to pull a log. In an ATA world, when you're trying to pull a log, you first have to figure out, is this log even supported on this device? That's one command to the device. The second is how big it is. So how long do my buffer needs to be to actually pull it? So that's the second command. And the third command is, or a multiple numbers of command is to actually go pull it in segments, right? If you can't pull it all in one. So those is, that's considered an operation. The same will be like I described the quickest erase. So in the erase form, the operation would be, go find what methods of erase is supported by this device, and then go figure out like how long those erases are gonna take, and then issue one of the erases that you can possibly take, right? And the other things um, that the operations can do is similar with the firmware download. You have a load file that you go into the operations and you have a device handle. So you open that device handle and figure out what all the different things you can do for that device, including the firmware download, and that operation takes place. And these are both libraries, the so OpenC transport and OpenC operations is a library that you can download from our GitHub page and use it on your own. And uh, there's a common library which has things like, oh, I wanna go check if this bit is set or not. So you can use that, that's part of it. Or, you know, big Indian, little Indian manipulations, that's part of the common libraries. So if you have the OpenC transport, and the OpenSea operations and the commons library, you have a tool set that you can now build on top of. So it doesn't matter if you're, whatever things that you're trying to provide, you can take those libraries and then use it. Once again, I wanna be very clear, we're not Seagate specific in that case. You can build those same type of things as long as you're following the T10, T13, NVMe spec. This open source contribution that Seagate has made will enable you to do some of those things that are industry standard. Right? So at the very last layer in that little you know, 
um, circle is the OpenSea chest. And OpenSea chest is the command line tools that built on top of these libraries. And if you're familiar with HDParm, SDParm, SG3 Utils, SmartMon tools, it's similar type of those tools, command line tools, but they're siloed in use cases. So HDParm is great, but it works mostly on uh, ATA world, right? And NVMe CLI, I use it all the time, but it only works in NVMe CLI, and it doesn't have any Windows port to it. So we're trying to make sure that we have broad, you know, um, interconnect as well as you know command layer, uh, you know, support to it as well as OS support to it. So if you want to do NVMe stuff that Windows allows you to do, we have them in our library. So you can actually, if you have a uh, there's a tool out there where you can use to actually download command in Windows to an NVMe device, get some logs, list the logs, those type of things. Right? So the other extension I want to talk about is how do you want to use it if you don't want to use our command line tools? You say, oh, you, you guys have it written this way. We don't want it. We just want to use your libraries. So we have within Seagate have different um, you know, labs and other places which have actually taken those libraries and created a Python ecosystem around it. So that's been done already, and you can, you can do that on your own. We are trying to actually create a Python extension to those libraries, and we're going to open source it as soon as it, we think it's available and, and ready for uh, public consumption. But it doesn't stop you from doing that. Another engineer took Go and encapsulated all our libraries in Go and did all of his container stuff with that. Um, I know at least one um, instance of the tool, which is using Java in, in front of it. So you have to do some of the marshalling on your own. Those of you who are familiar with how to take a C application and try to do it in a non, you know, in an unmanaged type of code versus managed type of code, you have to do some work there, but it's doable and you, you should be able to do that. One of the other things I really want to highlight is that it's a very active project, right? So if you want to tie into our ecosystem of this open source tool, you want to make sure that there are developers there working on it all the time. So this uh, chart that I'm showing on the right side shows the activity, and you can see this is activity in the past year. If you go to any of the open source uh, you know, projects, you want to make sure that the, the project that you are tying to have a backing of some software engineers in the back, right? So we have almost, it says 100,000 100, lines of code. I checked this morning, it was 139,000 lines of code out there. And there are people, about six engineers, who are actively working on it at all times. And also, in the past year, since we actually open sourced it, it's more than 1,000 commits. Those of you who are familiar with some of the other open source projects, number of commits really matter. If you go and say, you know, see a project that has a commit every six months, you probably want to think again, do you really want to tie into that project or not? So we have really active, really good engineers working on this project all the time. Call to action, we're really looking for the community to come together and help us support Big Indian. Uh, we have a few customers who have taken our tools and tried to use them in, as a, in, in their Big Indian ecosystem. They don't come back, so I mean, I hope that it works. That's why they didn't come back and ask more questions. But if you are one of those who are using Big Indian architecture, I encourage you to use our tools. We have a UEFI branch out there, but I would love for you, those who want to, so all it will need is that another UEFI transport layer just plugged in at the very first, you know, so if you are one of those who are using UEFI, please use ours. If you are one of those who use Ruby or Go, it's, it's a great way to use this, these libraries and create those extensions. In the very end, we have um, the links to the GitHub page. It's uh, github.com slash Seagate and then OpenCHS. And so all the libraries are in, um, you know, in the github.com and there is a uh, OpenC-API project which you can actually use to do some of the library work that you want to do. And the very last link uh, is a download that you can go from Seagate.com and it will download a um, executable, which when you run, if you have a USB key, it will create a USB key, Linux USB key, and will have all of our tools and software on it. So that way, if you just want to play with it, you don't want to actually you know, go download it, you can use the very last link, download that executable, create the USB key, and I assure you, you can plug it into any system, even if it's a 200 drive you know, Dell system, and it will boot up, and it will show you all of those 200 drives. So this is my talk, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to come to the booth and I'll be happy to answer for you.